So we ask Allah jami'an, all of us, for afiyah. For ourselves, our children, family members, loved ones, and obviously for our brothers and sisters in Palestine. May Allah provide them with sitr, with afiyah, with security, with victory, with help. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect them all against every calamity and may Allah destroy their enemies. وقضينا إلى بني إسرائيل في الكتاب لتفسدن في الأرض مرتين ولتعلن علوا كبيرا فإذا جاء وعد أولاهما بعثنا عليكم عبادا لنا أولي بأس شديد فجاسوا خلال الديار وكان وعدا مفعولا This is how valuable our women are to our religion and to ourselves. Men in Islam, Islam, I tell you how the Muslims played a role in it. In sacrifice in their life, I told you, the first Muslim, the first Muslim, on this planet is Khadija. The first Da'iyah is Khadija. Among the first who migrated for Islam was a woman, Fatima bint Uqba. And you know who the first martyr of Islam is? This didn't happen coincidentally. This didn't happen coincidentally. It happened for a reason. To tell us men and to tell us women, these are your samples. These are your idols. The first martyr of Islam was Sumayyah, radiallahu anha, the mother of Ammar. You know when they embraced Islam, they used to take every tree, every thirty, in a group and torture. The son of Mecca. You know who the worst one on their hearts was? This little thin tiny woman named Sumayyah. They were on her right side is Amma, her son. On her left side is her husband. Twenty-seven eighths of the people in the group. The harshest one on them is this woman. The what's on her? And she tells her, I should one night, ilaha illallah. So Abu Jahl goes up to her. She went, she, she drove him in a rage. What are you doing? She spit on his face. And he went in a rage and stabbed him in an unmentionable spot. To the point that the Prophet seen him and shed his tears. Sabran alayat. Be patient alayat. Victory is only coming soon. Our appointment with you is in heaven. We will meet in heaven. The first martyr of the son, a woman. When you want to be a true believer, who do you look up to? Who's your idol? Allah says it in the Quran. وَضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Allah said an example for the believers. The male believers, when I always say, when Allah says, Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu, or something is directed to the male, in Arabic it's known that women are included in it, automatically. Anyone who knows real Arabic knows that. Allah set an example for the universe of the true believers. Who ya Allah? Tell us who. Was it Musa in his struggle? Was it Ismail in his struggle? Was it Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the great struggle he did until he became victorious? Was it Abu Bakr? Was it Umar? Who are you trying to set an example for, Ya Allah? وَضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مْرَاتَ فِرْعَوْنَ The wife of Fir'aun. A woman. Telling us men, telling the woman, you want an example of a true believer? Ask ya. The wife of Fir'aun. وَضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مْرَاتَ فِرْعَوْنَ إِذْ قَالَتْ رَبِّ بِنِ لِي عِنْدَكَ بَيْتًا فِي الْجَنَّةِ Oh Allah, give me a house in heaven. You know the wife of Fir'aun was the stepmother of Musa. She's the one who raised Musa. Fir'aun is the stepmother of Musa. When they used to kill all the children of their time, Musa took him in and raised him by the will of Allah. Asiya was the stepmother of Musa. She said, رَبِّ بِنِّي لِعِنْدَكَ بَيْتًا فِي الْجَنَّةِ A sample for us. 
Allah set an example of a woman who had, you know who Fir'aun was? Fir'aun was the one who used to say, I give life and death. Fir'aun is the one who said, one of the evilest people on this planet, I give life and death. He used to brag about his palace. His palace was over the river. Do I not own Egypt? In the ocean flow from under me. Those same oceans he bragged about flowing under him are the same ones that put an end to him. His wife was the plural Ahmadab. The symbol of the best believer you want. Allah tells you, you believers, you want a symbol of a good believer, you look to a woman. Who is that woman? Asya. You know what she did? She believed in Musa when her biggest, Musa's biggest enemy was Fir'aun. He crucified his wife. And as she was being crucified, she said, the verses I'm reciting to you. رَبِّ إِبْنِ لِي عِنْدَكَ بَيْتًا فِي الْجَنَّةِ وَنَجِّنِي مِنْ فِرَاهُونَ وَعَمَلِهِ Rescue me from Fir'aun. Build me a palace. I don't want his cross. I want a palace in heaven. You know the interpretation in the hadith say, as she was being crucified, Allah put the palace that he has prepared for in heaven in front of her eyesight that she was looking at. وَنَجِّنِي مِنْ فِرَاهُونَ Rescue me from Fir'aun. وَعَمَلِهِ وَنَجِّنِي مِنَ الْقَوْمِ الظَّالِمِينَ Rescue me from these oppressors. إِذْ قَالَتْ رَبِّ بْنِ لِي عِنْدَكَ بَيْتًا فِي الْجَنَّةِ وَنَجِّنِي مِنْ فِرَعَوْنَ وَعَمَلِهِ وَنَجِّنِي مِنَ الْقَوْمِ الظَّالِمِينَ Rescue me from the oppressors. Rescue me from Fir'aun. She died. Is that an example? For us believers, us male believers, before the females? No. O Maryam ibn Imran. Allah is saying, don't forget Maryam. Also, don't forget Maryam. We have another example for you. O Maryam ibn Imran, alati ahsarat farjaha, fanafakna fihi miruhina. وَصَدَّقَتْ بِكَلِمَاتِ رَبِّهَا وَكُتُبِهِ وَكَانَتْ مِنَ الْقَانِتِينَ The famous and most righteous believer. Your shampoo? Asya in Maryam. Where's the Musa? Where's the Isa? Where's Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Where's Abu Bakr? This is how Islam raised the status of a woman. These were your mothers. These were the meek women who know the value of Islam, who know the commitment to them. Name me any matter in Islam, I say, I give you examples where the women played a role. You may say, ah, they played a role. What's the big deal about it? I say they played a role at a time when it was a shame to walk next to your wife. At a time when the men used to bury their daughters alive. This was a time Islam raised the woman from the dead. <laughs>Some take statements and use them broad and out of their context and combine them with other quotes of ulama and apply them randomly uh, without knowing uh, other meanings of these statements. Some in Arabic and some in English. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless someone with a talent of translating and some knowledge, it's important to know the limits. And I stress that many times over the years. That's not to discourage from da'wah. We desperately need dua and the haqq, but we need dua who know the ayah, the hadith, that principle of tawheed and shirk, that haram and halal that they're trying to convey. Some get too loose with the PDFs in their platform and speak on dangerous matters. Matters that you need to study, really study, study, not read, 30 to 40 volumes. And that's after studying the foundational knowledge is under shiuch and studying that matter itself under some shiuch of haq as well. Before coming to personal conclusions if one fears Allah. What are you going to do yawm al-qiyamah? قُلْ أَرَأَيْتُمْ مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ مِنْ رِزْقٍ فَجَعَلْتُمْ مِنُّ حَرَامًا وَحَلَالًا قُلْ أَاللَّهُ أَذِنَ لَكُمْ أَاللَّهُ أَذِنَ لَكُمْ أَمْ عَلَى اللَّهِ تَفْتَرُونَ وَمَا ظَنُّ الَّذِينَ يَفْتَرُونَ عَلَى اللَّهِ الْكَذِبَ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ You make some matters lawful and unlawful. Allah أَذِنَ لَكُمْ Did Allah give you permission and authorization or are you fabricating lies against Allah? 
That's in matters of haram and halal. So imagine matters of usul al-deen. That's not to discourage anyone. I, I repeat that from da'wah. The people are thirsty for the haqq. And there's a drought. But at the same time, one needs to know his limits and ability, especially in principal matters, so that they will not fall into error and misguide or be among the ones who said Allah mentioned in the super major sins, Abdurrahman ibn Abi Layla said, I met 120 of the Sahaba, each being asked about an issue. Then he refers it to the next and the next until it goes back to the first. Ahmad ibn Muhammad al-Iskafi al-Athram al-Ta'i who was a student of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal he said I would repeatedly hear Imam Ahmad saying I don't know in matters that I know he knows his, the, the opinions in them. Ibn Abbas and Ibn Mas'ud said anyone who answers every fatwa that's presented to him is crazy. When you read and live with someone's work so much and you study it and analyze it, you, you develop his style and terminology without even perceiving it sometimes. The context in what Ibn Taymiyyah used, Al-Muharramatul Zahira, sheds a little bit more light on the clarity of these types of sins. He was basically saying that they're clear and known successively and that anyone who denies them as being haram is a kafir without a dispute. He said, Inna al-imana. بوجوب الواجبات الظاهرة المتواترة وتحريم المحرمات الظاهرة المتواترة هو من أعظم أصول الإيمان وقواعد الدين والجاحد لها كافر باتفاق Believing that the clear, apparent, successive prohibitions are prohibited is among the biggest principles of Iman and the rules of this deen and one who denies them as being haram is a kafir without a dispute. He's saying those uh, who claim, for example, stealing, clear sin, is not haram, he's a kafir without a dispute. Now having used that quote of Ibn Taymiyyah, I must clarify that statement so it will not be misconstrued as it has been. The quote of Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, that I mentioned is saying one who denies an apparent successive prohibition, a haram, as being a haram, is kafir. That's where? That's in the 12th volume. In the 7th volume, he said, the one who denies the prohibition of the clear apparent haram after, look at that, after proof was established against him, then he's a kafir. That essential addition to what's in the 12th volume is significant. He said, on top of what's in the 12th volume, he said, those where proof has not been established against them, like the ones new into Islam, or those who live in towns far where the Sharia didn't reach to them, or someone who uh, made uh, an error, thinking the people who believe and do good deeds are exempt from the prohibition of drinking alcohol, like what happened during Umar radiallahu anh's time when he asked them to recant after he summoned them. Those and anyone like them, you ask them to repent and recant if they insist they are disbelievers. If they insist they are disbelievers and they are kuffar. And you don't rule that they are kuffar before that. The Sahaba didn't consider Qudama and his companions kuffar in their misunderstanding. And I'll get to that in a second. So in the 12th volume, there's no mention of excuse in such matters because it's summarized. Whereas in the 7th volume, he went into detail and mentioned the possibility of excuse due to ignorance in such matters. Authors sometimes give a conclusion, sometimes they elaborate. The elaboration defines the summary. And sometimes, what creates confusion is the fatwa is given based on a certain circumstance. And there's other reasons. So what Ibn Taymiyyah was talking about, he was talking about Qudama ibn Mab'un, who was a maternal uncle of Abdullah ibn Umar. He witnessed Badr and he was a governor of Umar radiallahu an in Bahrain. Qudama radiallahu an didn't believe alcohol was fully 
halal. But he believed that there's an exemption for those who do righteous good deeds based on the general terms of the ayah. لَيْسَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ جُنَاحٌ فِي مَا طَعِمُوا إِذَا مَتَّقَوْا وَآمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ ثُمَّ اتَّقَوْا وَآمَنُوا ثُمَّ اتَّقَوْا وَأَحْسَنُوا وَاللَّهُ يُحِبُّ الْمُحْسِنِينَ In Surah Al-Ma'idah, in summary, the meaning of the verse, those who believe and do righteous good deeds, there's no sin on them for what they consume, if they fear Allah. Imam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab, rahimahullah, said, it's by ijma' of the Sahaba, during the time of Umar, that they do takfir on Qudama and those with him, if they didn't repent. That's a statement used against Imam Muhammad uh, a lot. And they use it against him to claim that he declared takfir on a sahabi. But they don't say that he said, if they don't repent. If they don't repent. Qudama's ta'wil was clearly an innocent error in ta'wil, misinterpretation. Because as soon as the matter was explained to them, they repented from that misrepresentation. That verse was actually revealed pertaining to Khamra as well. It's not some random verse he pulled out and used it. It actually, the reason for revelation pertained to Khamra as well. In Musnad, uh, in Musnad Ahmad, Ibn Abbas said, the companions asked after Khamra was prohibited, Oh Messenger, what about those who died consuming alcohol? What's the status of those who died using alcohol before it was prohibited? They drank and they died drinking, never repented. Now it's prohibited. What's their status? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verse. Of course, the verse is an exemption for those who died consuming it before it was prohibited. Those who believe and do righteous good deeds, there is no sin on them for what they consumed. But his error, his error was in the ta'wil, misinterpretation to include those alive as well. Point being, there may be an excuse and ignorance in those matters based on certain times, certain eras. Era could be a factor. Uh, certain situations, certain individuals, factors that may weigh, weigh in to give an excuse. Like the example Ibn Taymiyyah gave, which I mentioned, a person who lives far away where Sharia ah didn't reach him and he can't reach anywhere. Or he got caught up in Dar al-Kufr, he took his shahada, there's no knowledgeable people or Muslims there. And he's ignorant some matters of halal, haram and halal. Ignorance that can be removed by learning is not an excuse for falling into haram or leaving an ordain. Ignorance where one sincerely wants to remove it with all that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him, but he can't. Ignorance where one can't remove it because the channels and avenues to the truth or the knowledge is not possible. So we took how to combine what Ibn Taymiyyah said in volume 7 and in volume 12. And if I stop here, it's going to be misconstrued even more. So my final point is what I said so far, we're talking about haram and halal. I didn't mention tawheed, did I? No, it did Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah. Haram and halal, al wajibat al zahira, al mutawatira, al muharramat al zahira. Asl al milla, the main clear principle matters of tawheed and major shirk, they're on a different level. There's no excuse in that. Ana aqul yawm li ruqus al arja. المتواجدين في المشرق أو في المغرب ماذا أخرجتم لنا اليوم ما هي ثمرة أعمالكم ما هي زبدة أو حصاد دعوتكم أخرجتم لنا جيلا لا يستطع مواجهة الفساد أخرجتم لنا جيلا فاشلا ضعيفا مهزوما منكوسا جيلا محطما نفسيا معنويا جيلا يقبل الاحتلال 
جيلا ترك الشريعة تعطيل أوامر الله ونواهي الله ليست شيئا كبيرا أو عظيما بالنسبة له روجتم للإرجاء نشرتم الفكر الإرجائي نشرتم التصور الإرجائي ألفتم المقالات الإرجائية ألفتم الكتب الإرجائية ألفتم الرسائل الإرجائية دروس صوتية في الإرجاء الجيل المنهزم المنبطح الذي نسجتموه من خلال عقود من التأصيل الخاطئ باسم عقيدة أهل السنة والجماعة ما هو إلا خذلان ما هو إلا تنصل ما هو إلا تهرب ما هو إلا هزيمة ما هو إلا إفلاس لدعوتكم النتيجة اليوم ظهور الردة في بلاد المسلمين لم تقابلوها بقمع ولم تكونوا أصحاب العزائم الصادقة في مواجهتها وإبطالها وتبيان قبحها ظهر الإلحاد في بلاد المسلمين وأنتم ساكتون معارك كبيرة من أجل السواك هو سنة نبينا عزيز علينا ننام ونستاك ونستيقظ ونستاك نتوضا ونستاك ونصلي ونستاك هو سنة حبيبة ميمنة لكن معارك كبير من أجله وانبطاح وخذلان أمام مسائل التي تقدح في التوحيد نواقض الإسلام الإخلال بشروط لا إله إلا الله سكوت عن المحتلين لبلاد المسلمين تدمير القيم قلب الموازين تغيير المقاييس هذه كلها كأنها لا تهمكم اليوم أصبح بين قوسين المنهج عندكم لحية وقميص اللحية شريفة والسنة واجبة أمر النبي عليه الصلاة والسلام بها والقميص لباس المسلمين على اختلاف البلدان كل واحد كيف يسميه لكن ليس منهج النبوة محصور في القميص واللحية والسواك إنما منهج النبوة شيء عظيم يبدأ بكلمة لا إله إلا الله قمة الإسلام أساسه وينتهي بجلسة استراحة في صلاة أو بابتسامة في وجه أخيك في مسائل التعامل الدين كامل متكامل اليوم حصدكم ثمرتكم كلها قد أخرجت هذا الجيل المنهزم جيل لا يأمر بالمعروف لأن عن مقر أقول الجيل الذين ربيتموه وعجنتموه في أيديكم بفتاوى مضللة فتاوى مقصودة ومغرضة فتاوى مشللة في المخابر وفي الأجهزة بطريقة دينية أخرجتم لنا جيلا لا يأمر بالمعروف لأنها على المنكر جيل يقول أقبل على نفسك ولا تهتم بأمتك ولا بمجتمعك ليس لك دخل ليس لك صلاحية لست من أهل هذا التغيير أخرجتم لنا جيلا فاشلا لا يستطيع أن يرفع بصره في وجه الفساق لا يستطيع أن يواجه أصحاب المخدرات ولا أصحاب الخمر كان قبل سنوات وقبل عقود الرجل المسلم السني السلفي يستطيع أن يغير حيا بأكمله بكلامه بخطبته بعزيمته بمواقفه بأمره بالمعروف ونهي عن المنكر اليوم لما يمر كأنه لم يمر إذا تكلم كأنه لم يتكلم هذا إذا تكلم ناهيك إذا نكس رأسه مر إلى المسجد ورجع إلى البيت هذا ما ربيتموه وهكذا أخرجتموه لنا هذا الملتزم بن قوسين الذين سميتموه سلفي السلفي الصحيح سلفي عقيدة وعبادة ومنهاجا وتشريعا وأمرا ونهيا وولاء وانتماء ربيتم لنا جيل اليوم يحب العلمانيين يحب المسلخين من الدين ويثني عليه ويقلب الدنيا بأكملها من أجل أن يدافع عنهم وينافح عنهم هذه دعوتكم 
يعني حاجز بقميص لحية كما فعلتم في ليبيا يعني فتاوى للهالك ربيع المدخل رأس الأرجاء والضلال الذي أفتى لجامعة ليبيا بالوقوف مع حفطر والذي برنامجه واضح علمنا وفصل الشريعة عن الحياة وهو أمريكي واضح في دعوته ورسالته أفتيتم لهم بالوقوف معه ثم بعد ذلك هذا الأسبوع تنصلتم من فتوتكم وقلتم نحن لم نقل لهم بالوقوف مع حفطر أهلكتم الأخضر واليابس أهلكتم الحرث والنسل بفتاويكم استحوا على وجوهكم ارجعوا إلى عقلكم وتوبوا إلى ربكم قبل هلاككم ووفاتكم إن منهج أهل السنة والجماعة أسمى أطهر وأنقى من أن يكون محصورا عند جماعة لها مصالح وتشترى ذممها وتبيع دينها ومنهجها من أجل فتات الدنيا والأحقر من ذلك من باع الدنيا لدنيا غيره أو من باع دينه لدنيا غيره فلا للدين أقمتم ولا للدنيا أصبتم بل أعطوكم الفتات ورغبوكم في بعض المجالس وأعطوكم بعض المحاضرات وكأنما وصلتم لم تصلوا إن منهج أهل السنة والجماعة ليس منهجكم منهج أهل السنة والجماعة مثل ما كان عليه شيخ الإسلام بن تيمية ومحمد بن عبد البر ومحمد بن عبد الوهاب وابن المبارك وسفيان ثوري لن لن تستطيعوا بدعوتكم ولا بمن وقف معكم أن تغيروا منهج أمة منهج النبوة منهج يدافع الله تعالى عنه ومنهج أصل له رسول الله عليه الصلاة والسلام أصوله وقطعياته وأساسياته ومنهج سار عليه الخلفاء الراشدون وصحابة المهديون رضي الله تعالى عنهم ومن سلك مسلكه من الفرقة الناجية والطائفة المنصورة التي هي فرقة ناجية حقا ومنصورة صدقة لأنها من عند الله توالي لله وتعمل الله وليست من ديل في أيدي الأنظمة البائسة ينتمندلون بها كيف شاءوا ويستعملونها بعد ذلك ثم يلقونها كخرقة في أودية الزبلات وقممة الأوساخ لأنها لا يحتاجون بطاقات بالية أما منهج السنة والجماعة لن يستطيع أحد أن يميعه أو أن يغيره لأنه محفوظ لأنه جزء من الذكر والوحي إنا نحن نزلنا الذكر وإن له لحافظون فمنهج أهل السنة والجماعة ذكر صالح ومنهج قيم وشريعة من الله قال تعالى فيها ثم جعلناك على شريعة من الأمر فاتبعها ولا تتبع أهواء الذين لا يعلمون وقال الله تعالى لكل جعلنا منكم شرعة ومنهاجا قال ابن عباس في مروى ابن أبي شيبة أي سبيلا وسنة A story of three bulls. The first bull was a black bull, another was red, and the third was white. And so with these three bulls, living amongst them was a lion. And the lion would watch them graze together and living together, and he said, if I ever tried attacking them, that I wouldn't be able to, because they would all defend one another. And so he came up with a plan. He went to the black bull and he went to the red bull and he said to them, if you allow me to eat the white bull, I will let you, the black bull and the red bull, live in peace. And so with that promise from the lion, those two bulls agreed. And so the lion went and he ate the white bull. Then as time passed, the lion became hungry again. And so he saw the black bull and he saw the red bull. And he said, let me go to the Red Bull. He went to the Red Bull and he said, allow me to eat the Black Bull and I will let you, the Red Bull, live in peace. Because I'm very big and I'm very ferocious, let me just kill him and eat him and I will let you live in peace. And so the Red Bull was happy with that promise and so he said, go and eat the Black Bull. And he allowed him to go and he didn't defend the Black Bull as the lion ate him. And of course, as time passed and the lion became hungry, he walked up to the red bull, and the red bull saw the death in the lion's eyes coming to him. And he saw the fangs of the lion, and he screamed out, Ala inni ukiltu yawma ukila sawrul abyal. Verily, I was actually eaten, and I actually died when the white bull died. And so the scholars are pointing out the story, because when you see a brother and a sister dying in Chechnya, 
It's you that's dying there. It's you who's dying on television. You see a mother and a father, that's your parents that are, are being killed on television. It's your family. The Prophet ﷺ said that the Ummah is like one body. That if one part of it is in pain, the whole, po the whole body spends the night in fever and in pain of that limb. And so when someone is amputated, it's your leg that's being amputated. When someone is having his throat slit, it's your throat that's being slit. And so it's not a question like the kuffar, because of the human nature, they want to go and help these people. Rather, you need to help yourself by helping those people. Et regardez, chose assez remarquable, le seul peuple au monde, la seule ethnie au monde qui sert le même Dieu que nous, le Dieu d'Abraham, Dieu unique, éternel, n'ayant ni femme, ni fils, ni, ni petit-fils, ni euh, Saint-Esprit, éternel, sans image, sans représentation, le seul peuple au monde, c'est Ishmael, l'islam. Tous les autres ont une représentation, ou pas de Dieu du tout, ou plusieurs. Le seul qui sert le même Dieu que nous, le Dieu unique sans forme, elle, c'est eux. Donc dans leur essence, ils sont, ils ont quelque chose. So, when talking about a, a common heritage, uh, in our... Jewish literature, we are taught that there is such a thing as a common faith, a fundamental religion which all men are born into, and this is a basic faith which is obligated on all mankind. In the past, we've called it by different names, the uh, Yere Shemaim, which means the fear of he the people who have fear of heaven, Gertoshav, or Bnei Noach, the children of uh, Noah, or during Hellenist times in Greek it was called Theosebea. Uh, and according to the school of thought of Rabbi ben uh, this fundamental faith is also called by the name Islam. Some have suggested that this refers to the great number of non-Jewish believers who came to sacrifice the Qurban Shlamim in Jerusalem together with the Jews. Salamai, Muslimai, Muslimi. This could be a clear indication in, in our literature that Islam is an ancient religion dating back to the time of the Second Temple or, uh, or even earlier. And if Islam's roots, if the roots of Islam are the same as what we call B'nai Noach, then for us it is much older. This is the religion of Noah, this is the religion of Adam himself. The, the closeness of, of Islam and Judaism has always been understood by biblical scholars un until recent years. The close relationship with the Jews, the, the Ten Lost Tribes, uh, the, the Arabs, the Rechabites, all this was assumed to be true. It was only with the advent of German revisionists like Wellhausen and Buchler and others who, that this began to change. They introduced ideas that Islam had something to do with worshipping the moon, rocks, or some asteroid that fell. Mm. The devout, jo devout Jews know that this is not true. It's a fact of Jewish law that we believe that Muslims and Muslims are perfect monotheists. They worship the same God that we do. Ислам, кроме всего прочего, он э, был так сформирован, что те, кто э, пошли за Мухаммадом и те, кто в дальнейшем, так сказать, э, вот, следовали за этой религией, они, э, как это сказать, <coughs> они постоянно э, находились в состоянии общения с Творцом. То есть э, христианин, ну, он там, если ходит э, раз в неделю, в воскресенье в церковь, ну, это хорошо. <laughs> в чем тоже, так сказать, да. А мусульманин, он пять раз в день опускается на колени. Пять раз в день. Причем строго вывены по времени, так сказать, я же с ними там живу, да. И кроме того, я когда вот, скажем, ездил в Европу, я где-то время там в аэропорту был, там такой тихий закуточек. Ну, пришло время молиться. Значит, я пошел в этот закуточек. Ко мне пришли туда двое мусульман. 
Я стоял, молился там в свое, они, значит, положили газетки, стали на колени. Это ислам. И, в общем, это, это говорится о очень многом. Человек пять раз в день, хотя бы на пять, это там молитва очень небольшая. Я смотрел, вот, мне так, была возможность посмотреть молитву, что в ней написано. Значит, молитва очень небольшая, но она очень серьезная, она очень глубокая. Человек на пять минут становится на колени, наклоняется, произносит то, что там написано, он общается в этот момент со Всевышним. Это очень важно, это очень много. Поэтому ислам, э, в общем, это религия будущего. Ну, так скажем, вот, если сегодня мир не будет закрыт, э, в силу того, что государство пока что, которое называется Израиль, существует, а это мы сейчас находимся именно на этой стадии, значит, идет стремительное закрытие мира. Потому что государство не имеет права на существование. Вот полтора года назад закончились все возможные допустимые сроки, все. Мир начал закрываться. То есть, ну, как бы, Всевышний закрывает мир. Все эти, так сказать, экономические и так далее, все эти катастрофы, которые идут одна за другой, любые попытки какого-то дальнейшего прогноза, значит, остановки, там, выбросы, это все бессмысленно. Мир будет закрыт. Это неизбежно. Если не, так сказать, ликвидирует вот это государство, которое является как раз корнем зла. Так вот, если удастся его ликвидировать, то где-то лет через... 70, я так думаю, большая часть населения Земли будет исповедовать ислам. Потому что это религия, которая ну, достаточно сильная, правильная, и она людей ведет в том направлении, в котором нужно. Единственное, что, конечно, там есть проблемы. Шииты, сунниты, значит, у них друг с другом нестыковка идет по некоторым вопросам. Ну, это понятно, но это пока что, я, я так надеюсь, что если удастся все-таки выйти на такой уровень, чтобы ликвидировать, так сказать, то, что у нас сегодня есть, вот корень зла, то тогда э, и уйдут все проблемы, которые есть между ними. И действительно, люди, большинство людей в мире начнет исповедовать ислам. Сегодня уже этот процесс виден, потому что они, так сказать, заполняют, распространяются. И там, я уже сейчас не помню, где-то в одной из европейских стран там категорически запретили строить новые мечети. Да. Но, э, потому что идет распространение. Будущее мира за исламом. Швейцария. Да, Швейцария, совершенно верно. Будущее мира за исламом, это совершенно точно. Если удастся вот сегодня локализовать ту проблему, которая имеется. Constant struggle. We want to make this aspect of constant struggle clear. Of course, the capitalism, of course, will confuse you. It presents things only as one-sided, one-sided, that things are only one-sided. When they talk about the Indians and the cowboys, you just get the cowboy side, not the Indian side. When they talk about the struggle in Palestine, it's just the Zionists, never the Palestine. I mean, never. The other day someone was sitting down looking at a movie. It was a movie about how these, you know, the Jewish people had suffered, and now because of their suffering, they were going to Palestine, a Zionist picture. So it was on television. So I walked out the room. Someone said, oh, you know, you are so racist. I said, I'm racist. Yes, this is a story, it's just a story about people suffering, and just that suffering, and you think, I said, when last have you seen a picture of a Palestinian family suffering on television? You will never see it. You will never see it, because they don't want to work up your sentiments to support the Palestinians. So the only stories you see are suffering stories of them all the time, all the time, all the time. One-sided view of life is given everywhere, this one-sided view of life. We must come to look at the other side.